Talk up you, Mr. Fee. Yes, man, that sounds more like it. Okay, everyone, good afternoon. My name is Giovanni Dennis. I'm a young journalist, and importantly, I'm a young person just like yourself. I'll be your host for today. We're at our second hashtag Youth for Chat Town Hall. It's a series of 14 that we're having in every single parish in Jamaica. The first one was in Montego Bay, St. James, uh, in last month, in, in April, the latter parts of April. And it's essentially a platform and uh, a new initiative that the Talk Up Youth is rolling out. It's essentially youth empowerment through dialogue, and it's funded by the United Nations Democracy Fund. And essentially, it's providing a platform for the youth between the ages of 14 and 24 a chance to get answers, workable solutions from their elected representatives and on finding ways to advocate. It is also um, a, a, a sort of way to increase your knowledge about your own constitutional and political rights and build your capacity in advocacy. So you must know how to advocate. So you're young and you're frustrated with some of the things that you see happening in our politics, as opposed to staying home and complaining we we'll come out and we we'll try to learn, and a lot of us are here among each other, and we we'll find ways of learning how to advocate and how we to effect change, the change that we want to see in our country. And essentially, we're saying that youth for chat. Good. Okay. Uh, importantly, we have with us as well some of your elected representatives, and we'll allow them to introduce themselves. Afternoon, everybody. Floyd Green, Minister of State in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, and more importantly, Member of Parliament for the best part of Jamaica, Southwest St. Elizabeth. Good afternoon, young people all. Derek Sangster, Councillor for the Mountainside Division in St. Elizabeth, Mayor of Black River, and by extension, Chairman of the St. Elizabeth Municipal Corporation. We also invited the other um, elected representatives as well from, the, uh, from, from Parliament. Uh, just to make a quick note as well, that Howard Hendricks is the president of the St. Elizabeth Chamber of Commerce. He will be here, he indicated that he will be late, and so he is on his way. Uh, Mr. Franklin Witter, he sent his apologies as well. That's MP Witter. Um, he's off the island and unavoidably could not be here. Uh, MP Evan Redmond also indicated that he was not able to attend today's town hall, but I understand him saying I'm sending blessings for everybody. Uh, MP JC Hutchinson, um, he's actually in his constituency today and he could not be here. However, uh, he sent his, his blessings as well. But more than that, more than that, I spoke with him last night to answer some of the questions that um, some of the 25 youth advocates that were trained yesterday had to ask him. And so we'll play them throughout the duration of today's town hall. Some responses to some questions that uh, some of the youth had from yesterday. And so initially, or right away, into the questions. The MP Floyd Green and Mayor Derek Sangster. One of the issues that came out at the workshop yesterday was the issue of access to higher education and the migration of graduates from the parish. What can be done, or should I ask, what are you doing to encourage more persons to remain in the parish and, and pursuing higher education? So it is an issue in relation to access and in relation to people staying. We still have the vast majority of our tertiary institutions are outside of St. Elizabeth. Fortunately, um, with NCU, it has become a little closer because it used to be that you have to travel to Kingston and also with the university expanding its reach, that's the UA and UTEC expanding its reach into St. James. What we do have are some sites, like in Junction, there's now a UA open campus. The Bethlehem Moravian College, I don't know if a lot of people know, but they've completely expanded their programs. So it's a lot now, much more than just teaching, and a lot more programs in relation to skills, services, they have a very strong hospitality program now. They're doing data management, business process. So we're trying to bring a, a, a wider expanse of tertiary training to the parish. We have Heart Trust NTA, which continues to expand its programs. There's one in Black River. There's also one in Junction. What I have done, I've met with the Heart Trust to look at the areas that we, again, see that people can be placed in jobs. Because we have to look at education and training and tie it into 
being able to do something productive at the end. Because again, it's not just getting training and getting a degree, but what you can do with it. So we're actually in June, we're going to be starting our unattached youth program at the Newell High School. Um, we're starting, we're looking to train 100 young people who are now outside of the secondary school process, but not in jobs and not in training. And we're going to be training them in four areas. Um, welding, plumbing, data processing, um, and I'll remember the next area and tell you before the end of the program. But again, if you realize, we're trying to focus largely on skills training. In terms of dealing with the migration issue, because we do have very good secondary institutions across the length and breadth of St. Elizabeth. So what I do find is we have to deal with the financing of tertiary education, because oftentimes people are, have completed secondary education, they do have the base required, but they're unable to go forward because of financing. So as a member of parliament, the majority of my CDF goes now to financing education in general, but more so tertiary education. But we're not going to deal with the migration unless we get more investment in St. Elizabeth, and that is a big issue. Um, how do you make it more attractive for people to invest, to set up business, and for the young people to also see that they themselves can set up businesses? How do you give them greater access to capital? Well, I want to concur a lot of what the Member of Parliament, you know, our Minister have said, in that, you know, invest, let me start at the end what he mentioned. It is critical that we have to concentrate on investment and developing the economy of the parish so as to be able to create more jobs and to ensure that more young people remain in the parish. In terms of education, it is a given that various students or various young persons might have various interests which will take them outside of the parish and cause them to migrate to other tertiary institutions abroad, you know, further out in the country. I don't think it's a matter that we can address overnight or it's a matter that we can stem at this particular time. In terms of secondary education, I think our secondary education, whilst we might need more space, it is very good at this present time. I think it is coping with the demand in terms of amount of students for secondary education at this particular time. Okay. Uh, well, among that issue, or stemming from that issue of, of, of education in, in the parish for the youth, is, is the matter of employment. And as Mr. Green mentioned, you need more investment in the parish. There's a lack of um, opportunities. And um, yesterday I spoke with MP for North East St. Elizabeth, uh, J.C. Hutchinson. And it's something I, I, I put to him, a lack of job opportunities is a recurring theme. And um, I just want to, to, to play his answer to that um, very important question, job opportunities for youth in St. Elizabeth. This is what Mr. Hutchinson had to say. Most of the parish has to go to Manchester to, to conduct business. You mentioned it briefly just now in, in a sense, but what's being done to address the, the issue, specifically now, issue of jobs and job opportunities in the parish? Well, that is the whole you. thing. We don't have any business people there, and so we are actually, we are within another couple of weeks, we are hoping to get the training center. We have a training center at La Covia, so we are looking to get the Lakovia Training Center up and running where we're going to be putting through uh, some hard search that the heart has decided to come on board. And so we are looking to train persons in hospitality, whereas you are aware they are opening up a number of hotels on the North Coast. We are hoping that many of these persons will be able to get um, jobs over there because we do not have any business space, no hotels within the parish where we would be able to employ anybody. But we also have projects, and one of the projects that we are uh, getting funding to is a mushroom project where we are looking to see if we can employ roughly 30 persons, and these are women and young people, within the district that are in the constituency. Each district we are looking to see if we can, after we get it from the employer, roughly 30 persons, young people, women, so that they can go into this mushroom project. And I think this will help greatly in lessening the unemployment that we have. Something you mentioned, Mr. Green, was the fact that a need for more investment in the parish. Um, Mr. Hutchinson admitted yesterday that you know, there are many communities where there is simply not enough economic possibilities outside of agriculture, perhaps. Um, what's being done, too? Because you mentioned that we need more, but what are you doing to get more yeah, in the parish? 
I, I don't want us to say outside of agriculture because part of what we'll have to do is really take a second look at agriculture, right? Um, every, every area has to look at their, their natural capabilities, their niche, and what are they good at? What will they attract investment around? Um, in St. Elizabeth, we're very good at agriculture. We've done it very well over the years, and if we put the proper infrastructure in place, then I believe we will blossom and grow. Um, so part of what we have to do and what we are doing is trying to get the infrastructure in place. We need better roads, right? Um, we need water, especially on the south side of the parish, the side that, that um, I represent, um, because we do have the farmers and we do have the young people who are naturally inclined to farming, but right now the, the cost benefit is, is much too hard. So at the end of the day, unless we get the irrigation supply into the field so that we can reduce the cost of water, which is a, a necessary input, that will be more difficult. We have gotten, for example, like Grace to come in and set up a pepper mash factory. We're trying to get them to expand. Well, more than trying, we've had discussions and Grace will be expanding their footprint. They'll be going into, through an arrangement with the government, we're looking at 60 acres where we want to cut it up and give, again, young people small plots because we do see agriculture as a viable option, right? And again, I, I don't think we have the discussion enough about if done properly, how much money can be made, that the fact that agriculture, people who are in agriculture are entrepreneurs and business people, and if done right, can take care of their family. So that is something that we have to look at. Again, you have to look at what are your natural, you know, advantages. We have a lot of land in St. Elizabeth, a lot of unused land. Um, so again, what sort of investment? We do need to learn somebody who does processing because the reality again with agriculture is you have to move from primary production to secondary so you have to move from just reaping to making the value added the jams the juices so what we have to do we're out in the field now and i, I can speak for the mayor and i trying to say to people that saint elizabeth is open for business come down we do believe that with the reopening of alpart that we will see a boost in the, industry, in, the, in, in the economy of St. Elizabeth that will have a natural spillover. We're talking about over 1,000 people will be employed and to go up to a high of 3,000 people. So that will help because what you find is once there's employment, then it, it will have a, a positive impact on like the restaurant industry or yeah. bars all over. So we're looking forward to that. The final thing I'll say is from the ministry's perspective now and from youth perspective, we're trying to see how we can say to young people, come together in groups, look around in your community, come up with an idea that you can monetize. The only way we're going to get more jobs are if we have more people who are willing to go into business. Part of the difficulty we have is that a lot of our young people, and I understand why, are very afraid to take the risk or might not have the access to capital to take the risk to go into business. We're trying to make that easier, and I guess later on I'll tell you about what we want to do with our innovation centers to ensure that we can provide that if you have an idea, there's somebody who can move that idea from idea into actual business. Uh, just beside you is Onika Foster. Uh, Onika Foster, she had a question. Uh, she's one of our advocates that was trained yesterday. Uh, go ahead, Onika. Generally, everybody keep on going to the MPs with problems, but I wanted to make a solution. In my area, Thornton, the community center is out of use. So if the community <coughs> center is out of use, why don't we use the school to make a difference? The school is there for everybody, right? So we can use the school to make a difference. Use the school to provide a place for, for, for our young people, persons who are doing GSAT. Many persons want the help, but nowhere to go. Persons doing CXC, and also persons who just need personal development. So, Community centers, the issue, uh, Mayor Sangster, wh wh what are we doing to, to improve the community centers ac across the parish? Um, community centers would really be an issue where respective members of parliament, you know, um, take the initiative whether to seek funding from the ministry to repair or to build these community centers if they are existing already. The point being raised, you know, is, is very good in that if there's an existing building already, then what the district or the community must do is to make the necessary representation to the member of parliament to seek the funding or to make the funding available to repair, renovate that community center and put some sort of training process in there, you know, for the young people in the community. The idea of the school, yes, is fine, but if there's an existing building, you know, 
that must be resuscitated. In terms of the overall um, situation, I know that the government in its program is very keen on ensuring that community centers where they exist are renovated and resuscitated so it can be of service to the young people and the community as a whole. And if they are non in a respective community, then I know that members of parliament can make the necessary representation to ensure the construction of one such facility for the benefit of the community. Okay, you have a, a follow-up question? In addition to what she said, we face similar um, problems in Balaclava. The community center is at a good area, but it's locked up. The facility is locked up. Um, it's actually damaged. We actually went to the member of parliament from last year that was Everton Fisher. No, no, he's a Raymond counselor. Price. But he's a counselor, no, but in previous times we've been to him and we haven't got any response and the backboards are damaged. It's locked up. Um, actually, the rat bats live inside. They own the pain the outside, um, the outside and labor day and the bush outside is taller than me, trust me. We actually play balls, um, basketballs and summer and we have to squeeze ourselves through the gate. It's locked. We don't have access to it. It's not access well, open to the public. That's it? Yes. Well, you know, um, I hear your point, and it's, it's pretty, this is in the town of Balaclava itself, that center is? Yes. Well, what I can say at this point in time, I will certainly speak with the council official um, and tell him that, you know, the concern was raised at this forum, and if he can liaise with the member of parliament, Mr. Redmond, and between them, they must be able to take some initiative to get the center put back in proper condition and reactivated for the benefit of the community, especially the young people. But I will give you an undertaking um, to speak also to Mr. Redmond and speak with um, former Mayor Everton Bishop. Are you satisfied with, the, with how you are able to access your member of parliament um, youth, yes or no? So they are not afraid to say that they are inaccessible. But importantly though, so inaccessibility is an issue. Uh, you're here as the mayor, and you're saying that you think you know, there's something that they can do. How can the youth here now follow up with you? How can they get in touch? How can they make these requests and advocate to have something like that, um, a very real um, community center fixed? Because it's one community center. Well, you know, if, if they so wish, they can contact me. They can come and see me. I'm at the council most days, unless I have some meeting in Kingston, Montego Bay, or somewhere. They can come there. See me. I, What's the address for the council? Write this down. I, I black about it. At a, it's, it's no longer a parish council. It's called. It's now called the mm -hmm. municipal corporation as a result of some acts that were passed last year. Or they can call this um, the, the municipal corporation. Um, the number of my um, particular phone is nine six five twenty thirty eight. Nine that's six five twenty thirty eight. Hold on, yeah, second. That's the mayor's, the mayor's parlor number. Um, and you can, you know, I operate basically what I like to term as an open door policy. You don't have to make no appointment. As long as I'm there, you can come and I will see you. If I can help, I will make the necessary initiatives to assist. If I can't, I will send you on to the MP, who, by the way, controls a lot more cash than the poor councillor and the poor parish council. Um, that is not true. <laughs> let, let me make that clear. You, but, you, you had seen that you wanted to, to, to chip in when Jordan yeah, had asked I, I the want question. To say, Go ahead. There's a couple of things in, in relation to community centers. I do find that across the length and breadth of Jamaica and St. Elizabeth, we have a lot of community centers that have been built that are un, not functioning. Right? Um, partially, one of the problems is that after the center is built, nothing is put in place to ensure sustainable management of the center. And I, I often say to the young people, every problem, you know, you can also find a solution, right? So one of the things I would suggest is that you get a youth club up and running, which will have as its base the community center and as its mandate to get the community center up and running and functional, right? The other thing is that we have to remember, you have to advocate for a number of these things. And, you know, I, I do find sometimes we, we stop. So... You have to write. Write a letter to the mayor. Write a letter to your member of parliament. Write a letter to your councillor. Right? Because if the youth center is there, it should be open. We had a youth center that um, 
wasn't active for a very long time, right? And I said to the young people, if you want the member of parliament to invest in the youth center, first show me that you are willing to put something in place that will make it functional. Because the worst thing to happen is to invest to fix it up and then two months down the line, it locked back up. So they started to have before fixing it up. They started to have their meetings there. They started back up a netball. They started back up a football, right? We had some difficulty with the electricity. And now we can say, all right, let's invest in it now because we can see a sustainable management model. So I'm saying all of that to say, get a group of you together. You're always stronger when you're a group, when you're a team. Start writing and start putting a plan in place for the youth center. And you will find most members of parliament will have to fall in line. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Tasha Gay Woolery, and I'm actually here representing from the Youth Under Eyes Club that's in Newton. All right, so my problem is, or my issue is, with the Glen Broomfield Center in Barton, right? So we, well, we have made many um, attempts in terms of writing to the mayor, requesting that, you know, we're, we're trying to cover the light bill. We're trying to pay off for the light because the, the rent is a lot and we wanted to cover it off. So we, we wrote to the mayor requesting help and nothing was done. Our MPs are aware of it because he was the one who was you know, helping us in terms of doing this, but we wrote to the mayor, we called and nothing was done. So I'm asking now what, what is going to happen now? What, what to move forward? What's the next step? Well, first of all, what mayor did you write to last year? From 2015. <laughs> Oh, oh, From 2015, oh. sorry. Okay, okay. Because had you written to this mayor, I would have at least responded whether I can, you know, do anything. But what you're saying is that what? You owe some bills? Yes, yeah, some bills are owed at the Glen. Yeah, it's clear now, but I'm saying previous to now, you know, in 2015, we wrote and nothing was done. You know, we got no response. But have you, have you, approached, the, eh? have you approached the member of parliament? Yes, yes. I and what, what was the response? He advised us to write to the mayor, and that's what we did. The MP yes. <laughs> advised you yes. to write to yes. the mayor. Yes. I like Mr. that. Mr. Mr. Hutchinson, he advised us to write to the mayor, and that's what we did. Pardon me? You're from Newton, is it? Yes, I am from Newton. So that's my good friend, the Honorable J.C. Hutchinson. Mr. J.C. Hutchinson. Eh? Well, what, what I can say to you, you can write me as the current mayor, um, and let me see what can be done, or if you wish, you can call and then come in to see if I'm going to be in the office one day and come in. Um, I don't know, is it, I don't want you to quote the figure, but is the figure high, low? We cleared it, we, we, we cleared it, it's it settled. But oh, I'm you cleared saying, it. I'm saying is when we, yeah, as a group, as a, as a youth group, you know, youth on the rise, we, we cleared it with our own funds that we raised. But I'm saying, we raised the issue and nothing was done. Like, we wrote to the, to the, to the MP then and, you know, to, to the mayor and nothing was done, so. Well, write to me again and then, you know, I will, when I see what is in it, I will speak with the relevant MP and see if together we can get something going to satisfy, All right, you know. sir, can you please, can you please repeat your contact information? All right, that's good. That's a good question. I like the advocacy so far. I soon come to you. Uh, we have one more question, then we have another one from our youth advocate. So go ahead with your question. Let's introduce yourself. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Russell Barrett. I'm from the Northeast um, constituency of St. Elizabeth. Um, but my question is not really directed particularly to this constituency, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Minister. And it has to do really with access as it relates to the points that Minister spoke about, about um, electricity being one and internet access. I find it ironic, right, that St. Elizabeth, in St. Elizabeth, there's a JPS wind turbine that is supposed to generate electricity. And I don't know for myself, but I know for my sister who does a lot of work down here, she said there are several times within the month that the current goes and comes in and it affects her appliance. I really want to know what is the situation. I wish somebody from JPS was here, but there has been a constant disconnect of electricity and it not only affects the appliances but the internet access is one as well so you find that they're not able to access it as they would want to so my question is what um if any dialogue has taken place with the jps and other stakeholders as to how to make the electricity access more sustainable in the parish of st elizabeth um what particular community you're from well um we're from santa cruz we live in the um ridgeview um, community. Okay. Right. Well, first of all, 
he mentioned wind turbine. And I assume that you speak of the... One in Malvern. One in Malvern. Right. But that is supplying um, electricity to the grid, you know. Um, I, I can't speak to the precise megawatts or whatever, but it's supplying a fair amount of electricity to the grid. The Santa Cruz area, and I can't tell you the extent of it, whether it stretches as far as to Maggot or what, but the Santa Cruz area does have a particular problem. I am not technically off in that sort of you know, uh, matter, but whether it is an overloading problem or other technical difficulties, the frequency of power outages in the Santa Cruz area is a matter that's been brought up several times at committee meetings. Um, I can't speak to what JPS is doing to remedy the situation because, for instance, um, I think it was about two, three years ago, the infirmary down on, the, on, on Institution Drive, which is a part of the parish council or the Ministerial Cooperation, had instruments that were badly damaged because of this power outage. So I can speak to that in terms of this area. As to what is being done and what the eventual remedy will be, I can't speak to because that, you know, a JPS representative isn't here. But we understand. But not even over in the, in, on the south side, there are frequent outages. Whether it is an overload situation, um, I think I've heard where JPS is, plan, is planning to introduce new equipment and machinery to increase their output but you know in terms of details i can't speak to that but i understand and appreciate the predicament at your your arm and i can speak to it but it's only a pity as you said that the jps representative is not here okay and and from a youth level mayor is it that the you said the parish manager normally comes to these meetings yes. is it appropriate then for the youth or can we channel it through the municipal to go ahead and um, communicate to the JPS that listen, this is an issue that is affecting us. We want this to be dealt with. Or do we ourselves as youth write to the parish manager and say, listen, this is the issue that is affecting us. We, we, we need some sustainability with our electricity because it's affecting our internet access and we need it to progress. Well, you can write to the JPS, you know, but also um, if one or two members of the youth um, body want to come to our, what, what is termed the regular council meeting, which is every second Thursday. Right. Um, our, our members, representatives from the public can come to that meeting, okay. at which you can hear for yourself, and you can ask a question, and the, um, a JPS representative will, uh, you know, will respond. But in the meantime, you can write to me, and then I will take the matter in the meeting, you know, if you're not able to attend, and express the concerns and seek to get some answers for you. And I would just suggest you write to everybody, right? Um, you write to your councillor, you write to your member of parliament, you write to the mayor, you write to JPS. Sometimes we need your help as well, right? Because remember, we are your representatives. And when we raise an issue, we also want to hear directly from the people that the issue affects. And we want the service provider to hear directly from the people it affects. So it does help when you write directly to JPS and say, listen, this is an issue. And again, don't underestimate the reach of a councillor and the reach of local government. Because the reality is, as the mayor has said, local government has regular meetings with almost all utility providers. The, the National Water Commission, the JPS, and the parish council meetings, municipal corporations, they're open to the public. So you can go on a Tuesday, you can sit down, you can raise your issue. So again, there are avenues. And part of what I think all of us as youth Young people have to do, you have to find out those avenues and access it and utilize them. So good afternoon, everyone. So my question is directed both to Mr. Songs and Mr. Green. One hand can clap. Therefore, we can do better. As leaders, how best do you think you can incorporate youth and their skills in your constituency plans? Also, how are constituency development funds being used? Well, you know, in terms of the first part of your question, um, how can we incorporate youth? Um, through various aspects, we can go through the medium of youth clubs, um, sports um, teams, and what have you, and involve the youth in the operations of the communities. Um, in terms of the council itself, you know, if there is any program 
that the co may, may, might be coming through the council, we can ensure that we involve the youth as much as possible in those programs um, that will involve, be involved at a community level. Now, um, community development funds. We at the, at the municipal corporation, we do not receive that type of funding that is classified as that, okay? It is the member of parliament that really gets those sort of funds. What happens in our circumstances is that each councillor gets an allocation each month which goes towards drain cleaning, bushing of roads, and other um, you know, functions in the respective communities. We do not really at this particular time get funds that can be deemed as development funds in terms of doing things out there, doing things for individuals. For instance, you know, one of the areas that we'd love to help in is say assisting persons, indigent persons. You know, um, an old lady might want four sheets of zinc or some of my or two sheets of ply to you know there's a certain reality out there that they want two sheets of ply just to back up the side the side of the house we at the municipal corporation do not receive that sort of funds we only receive funds in terms of attention to the roads and to repair mall roads and fixed roads all right uh yeah all right so what we're trying to do in terms of incorporation incorporating our young people one, to revive our youth club movement. Um, unfortunately, our youth club movement has really um, been on the decline. And, you know, you have to find ways in which you can reach to the young people. So we've go, we're going around now and trying to see how we can get in each community to get back up their youth clubs, right? Um, so that they can, one, we can have avenues that, so that they can talk to their member of parliament. They can come up with ideas. As the mayor said, sports is always a good a good aspect to get our young people involved and we just completed in Southwest our football and domino competition but also what I really try to do is to communicate with our young people using the communication channels that they utilize so social media so I have an active Facebook page and um, I, I do check my messages myself people do write especially our young people to indicate where they're having problems difficulties how they can access the office I also have office hours so I am in the office on a Friday um, that's in Black River, um, <clears throat> right to the town across from Scotiabank, where people can come, both young and old, can come and raise their issues. Um, constituency Development Fund, so just to indicate how it operates, and a very good question. So CDF, the CDF is, a, is the funds that a member of parliament, each member of parliament gets what's called the Constituency Development Fund. It's $20 million for the entire year. I'll repeat it slowly, $20 million for the entire year. Sounds a lot when you say it initially, but probably when I break it down in terms of what my funds do, you will realize that $20 million is nowhere near enough if you have to serve a constituency. So from the CDF one, there are certain ways that you can spend and you cannot spend the CDF. So the CDF is not so that you can put money into somebody's hand. The CDF is not for that purpose. For all funds from the CDF, you have to use what we call an implementing agency. There must be a third party, and money has to be played, paid to a supplier. It cannot be played to an individual. So, you know, people used to, it used to be that, you know, you go to an MP, if you want a little money, and they say that the MP can give you money, we don't get funds for that. Absolutely not. So if an MP is to say you have a difficulty and you want a thousand dollar, an MP would have to find his own personal resources to give that funds because it cannot be taken from the CDF because the CDF has to be run through an agency. You have to have things like an invoice. It has to go to a supplier. So normally with my CDF, I use implementing agencies like the parish council, like the social development commission, that's the SDC, um, RADA for farming equipment. So Nine out of ten times, you have, to, you have to write a program and you have to spend in accordance with that program. So my CDF for last year, I spent $6.5 million on education, right? So that's the majority of my, my, my biggest allocation for my CDF was to education. That provides book grants, that provides fees, and it sounds like a lot when you say $6.5 million, but you all should know that if you have a student... Um, or if you are at the tertiary level, your fees are like, what, 300000 and above, right? So clearly we can't provide full fees. In fact, I only do one full scholarship, and then I do contributions for everybody else at the tertiary level. My, the approach that I have taken is, because there are so many needs, um, is to spread it, 
instead of trying to treat with everybody's needs, right? Um, I implemented last year at the primary level, I give a prize for the top, the top boy and the top girl, and I also give a prize for the top teacher, right? So when you look at the 6.5 million, we were able to help about a thousand people last year across the constituency. And what I try to ensure, using the technology, I ensure that every single community that somebody has been helped from every single community. And that's the plan that we're going to take this year. So that was 6.5 for education. I did 2 million for agriculture. Again, it sounds a lot. When you think about fertilizer, when you think about if you want to run a program where you're helping with livestock, where you're helping with pesticides, um, it's not much. And all agencies charge an agency fee to administer the program. So 10% of everything I've told you has to go to the parish council. Well, the parish council doesn't charge for education, which is a very, very big plus, right? But like rather, they have a 10% agency fee. So that's 2 million for agriculture, 6.5 million for education. I also did last year 3 million for welfare. So that is now people who, you know, when you are sick, elderly, um, groceries, and again, it's not directly to them. It has to be run through a supplier. I also did, um, I didn't do any disaster management. I did an economic enablement grant. That's for people who have businesses, right? That wasn't much. I want to increase that this year. I did 500,000 for that. I did social water last year because, you know, water is a big issue in the south side of the parish. So that water is, that, that money, 1.5 million was for trucking water into areas. Now, fortunately, we got some rain, so I was able to reallocate half of that to do a road. You heard all that I've said that 20 million cannot stretch to road, right? So a lot of times people say, boy, member of parliament, our road is in a terrible condition. Um, we wanted to fix it. Of course, I want to fix it. But you have to say, where is the money going to come from? So what we have to do as MP, we have to try and advocate to the National Works Agency, to the HOPE Secretariat, to the farm road program to try and get those money for road because one road project is at least four or five million dollars, right? So that's some of what you know my CDF. Um, my I just want sorry, I just want to add something further. And um, MP made a quick mention of it. Um, the Social Development Commission, okay, I'm sure most of you have heard of it or have been in touch with it. It's an agency of government, works closely with us at the municipal cooperation. But, you know, the Social Co Development Commission is one area that young people can become involved, not only in their community, but in the parish as a whole. There are thing, bodies called CDCs, Community Development Committees, which are formed through the SDC. What you have to do is either contact your councillor, your member of parliament, or go to the SDC office here about the play field at Santa Cruz, and tell them you want to form a CDC in Newton, for instance. You know, they come and they form it, and through the CDCs, it's a very critical and vital body. They can get funding. Let me give you an example. There's a very active CDC in middle quarters. Two years ago, they did a project, and they got $10 million from the Japanese government through the Japanese embassy here in Jamaica to build a lovely community center at Whitehall. Mayor, let me quickly interject. You know, One of these is though, so you mentioned that there's a CDC and that they can access that, you know, make representation through their MPs to, about, uh, to, to find out about the CDC, right? To get an officer from SDC right. to come and form. But if one of the issues, as I mentioned, is uh, inaccessibility of some of the member <laughs> of parliaments, and that's, that's, that, that's a major issue that we have to contend with and have to work on fixing that going forward. But as I say, they're going to contact you and you're going to make some, some, give them some assistance to fix that. So we're having issues with light, the internet. Uh, I heard uh, both the mayor and um, MP Green speak about the roads as well. I also asked um, JC Hutchinson yesterday, Member of Parliament Hutchinson, about roads um, in his constituency and generally in, in the parish. Um, this is what uh, Mr. Hutchinson had to say about the issue of poor roads, essentially, which affects the entire parish. Penultimately, no. Um, someone saying why the roads in Middlesex, um, Saint Elizabeth, and other communities in your constituents are in such a deplorable state. <laughs> That's a joke. Because I think everybody understands quite clearly that the constituency has been sabotaged over the years. And let me just state it quite clearly. Everybody knows that 
for 19 years, and I will state it plainly here, there is not one road that I have got from any minister of work under the PNP government. Not one road from I have been MP, and that is there to be seen. Since coming into power between 2008 and 2011, we got the road from Moko to Springfield Creek. We are going to get the one from Springfield to Pisgah going, but we were taken out. Since coming into power last year, we are now working on the new market to Middle Quarters Road. We are working on the road from Arcadia coming down to Magati. And we have done quite a number of other Paris Council roads in the constituency. As a matter of fact, 10 Paris Council roads we have um, rehabilitated partially since coming to power um, last year. So, I mean, we have been doing roads right across the con constituency since coming to power last year, more than any other constituency. What is the plans of the government re the sustainable financing of tertiary education? And as students, we understand that we have a responsibility to finance our education, but I believe that the government has a role to play. What is the government's position on this? Yeah, I, I think the government agrees that it has a role to play, and, and you would have seen that we stepped in to ensure that um, especially the final year students who would have um, reached thus far and were not able to um, sit their exams that they were able to, and I think it, it shows a clear intention of how the government views it. We want to help as much as possible. Um, there are realities, and I think we, we, we all are aware that we don't have an unlimited supply of resources, and the education budget is so much and no more, and every time, just as you do with a household, when you try to give more to one area, you have to look at where you're going to take it from in another area, right? Um, what we're doing now, and we agree just like you, that we have to come up with a, a, a more sustainable plan. Um, there are a number of suggestions. We actually went to our youth advisors. As you may know, we have a youth advisor council that we um, put in place last year. We went to them and they gave us some ideas in relation to what they think should be done. The prime minister, when he recently was inducted in the university's hall of fame, um, gave put it out there, some of the thinking. Should we be looking to give more money into loan funds and to make those funds more accessible, to reduce the burden that is now on students in relation to guarantors so that more students can get that funding and then those funds, the student can choose how to use it. So whether they want to go to UE, whether they want to go to NCU, should that be the approach? Because as it is now, we give money to the SLB, but we also give money to the university. So we still, as a government, we still pay for about 60% of the cost for every student at the University of the West Indies. Now, would it be a better model if we were to reduce that to, let's say, 40 50%? and take that 10% and put it into loan funding so that everybody could get the funding. So you could get more money to finance your full journey. We haven't decided on the complete approach yet. We have a committee in place. Um, we hope to have those deliberations finished, hopefully before the end of this year, so that we don't have the same sort of scenario going into next year. What we have been doing, however, we have been taking incremental steps to show our intention. So you would recognize that we are reducing the burden regarding student loan. So we reduce the interest rates in this month's budget, in this year's budget, um, so that it's easier, especially for repayment. We're now calculating on a reducing balance method, so it's much easier in terms of how much you have to repay, and we're going to be taking steps in that direction. So I can tell you, the thinking is, the final thing I'll say, the thinking is, and, and we would love to talk about, we throw this out to you, we would love for as much young people to tell us what you think should be done, but what I can say that there are some areas that the government and the country needs more trained people in that I think we will have to find ways to incentivize that study. So yes, it's all good and well that you want to go to the university, 
that you feel like your passion is philosophy and that is what you want to study, fair enough. Should the government be underwriting that cost, knowing that as it is now in our marketplace, we don't have more space for philosophy graduates? So, so those are real hard decisions that we're looking at, but I can tell you, we have to look at areas that we know because it is frustrating when you do finish your course of study and then you go out and you can't find a job. One of the first things that um, the minister mentioned, and this is something that is very important for all of us, is that we, we, there are, we are producing a lot of graduates very bright in areas that we, we essentially are overloaded in already. So there are areas, emerging markets right now, that we'll need more um, specialists in. And you, you, you mentioned just now trade. As a little youth, I got my granny and my grandmother and my grandfather, and the big man in my community always say, every man must have a skill or a trade, essentially. So it's not to say don't do your, your academic pursuits, because outside of Jamaica, because we're, we're in a globalized world now, and no we can go far and go work at some point. It don't have to be the United States if Mr. Trump decides to say no one of Jamaicans in him country. Not giving any trouble. But there are elsewhere that we can go and work with our, our, our degree that we love. But we're saying if we're in Jamaica in this country, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, Minister, get a skill, a trade in something that there's a need in Jamaica so that you make yourself more employable, especially if you have a second degree. Wrong, am I right? No, you're, you're completely right. And what we have to stop doing, it used to be we talk about skills like is if you can do nothing else, right? So you go to heart because you can't get in somewhere else no that, that, that we have to change that mindset altogether because to be honest the skill labels are the ones that you can't replace almost everybody else can be um you know you can find a technology solution to replace the skill labels are the ones that are making significant resources in in, in the new modern day okay Oop. one last one you last one last one <laughs> you raised the issue of agriculture earlier the government has been on a mission to promote agro-parks. My question is, how can the government facilitate more young people being engaged in agro-parks? Before you answer, before you answer, uh, we ask a question as well because um, Mr. Hutchinson is the state minister for agriculture as well. And um, this is, he, we asked him that question, so you can just, just give him the, the, he responded to that in terms of what he would be doing and what is being done as well to encourage youth participation in agriculture. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson um, did speak to agriculture and youth involvement in agriculture. Final, Khalid? Mostly agricultural, um, what is being done? The constituency is mostly agricultural. Um, what is being done to encourage, um, to ensure rather that young people who wish to pursue this field of agriculture have sufficient markets? All right, what happens is that, as, as you mentioned, we have no uh, major towns there. We don't have any entrepreneurs whatsoever, no business person that helps out in any of, type of activity at all. As far as sporting activity is concerned, throughout the constituency, there is no entrepreneur, no business person that really engages themselves in helping the young people. Whatever has to be done, I have to do it either through government uh, funds or through my personal income, I have to help out. So we are looking at agriculture. And with agriculture, we have set up uh, organizations, farmers organizations named PMOs, production and marketing organizations, where we have all the presidents and there is meeting once a month, every first Saturday we meet at the La Cova Community Center and discuss all aspects of agriculture and other activities to uplift the people in the constituency. So what we do, whatever, whenever we get any funds, we channel it through these PMOs to the genuine farmers and we also see if we can help those young people who want to get into agriculture. We give them a push start by providing them with seeds, fertilizer. Um, through the organization, we also provide them with two spray pans 
sometimes, who fork machine and that sort of thing, so that they can get a push start in life. So he says you're getting a foot start. So go to him and um, you'll be given the assistance, all right? Um, Janelle, I have a very important question. Go ahead, Janelle. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, relates to the Santa Cruz Library. It is very small and hot and often congested. Um, personally, I think that it should be relocated. Um, I was wondering if you have the same sentiment, share the same sentiment as it regards to the library. Well, um, first of all, you know, unfortunately, I know, I understand what you're saying. Some lands that were owned by the parish council or the municipal corporation, right beside it, were sold. And therefore, the space around the library has become a little constricted. Um, because it was in February that the parish manager for the library service came to see me. And this was one, one of the complaints that she put forward to me. You know, for instance, in terms of the truck coming from Kingston with, with books from the head office in Kingston. You know, it, it, it doesn't have a parking space again. It has a park on the street. Um, the point you have raised about the relocation is not something that I had thought of, and the parish manager didn't bring up that. But it is, given the current situation, it is a thinkable proposal, and it is um, something that I have to put to higher authorities. You know, once we can find the, um, a convenient, well, that would be the problem in Santa Cruz here right now, a convenient location yeah. within the town that would not inconvenience anyone to, re to make a replacement. But you have raised something in my mind, to be very honest with you, and it is certainly something that I will look at. Right. You know, I can't guarantee you that it will happen, but it's a very interesting point, very interesting point. Good stuff. La Queen, your question, he had a question as well. La, La Queen is one of our uh, advocates that have been, has been trained in advocacy uh, by the Talk of You team. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, my name is La Queen Brooks, and I'm a young advocate in training. Thanks to the Talk of You, Mr. Talk Up. All right, and I'm here today with the question... Wanting to, I wanted to propose my question to the mayor and also the member of parliament for my area, Mr. Redmond, and, but he's not here today, surprisingly, I guess, right? He, ha he, has, he hasn't been to many of our meetings, so he's, 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 he's the one most sending, sending his blessings, as Giovanni mentioned. Okay, um, the question I'm pro proposing to Mr. Mayor um, is several communities in St. Elizabeth, in St. Elizabeth, such as Southampton, has an issue with water supply. In some of these communities, the standpipes are not working and the residents are traveling elsewhere to fetch water. What sustainable plans are there to ensure that all these members of the communities have easy access to water? Okay, um, the, 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 the matter you're raising is really substantively um, um, the arena of the National Water Commission. But then again, the NWC does attend our committee meetings as part of the agencies, you know, public agencies um, that, that, that we are concerned with. Your community is perhaps not, you know, the only one that is suffering from woes in terms of supply of potable water. Um, first of all, the standpipes. I don't know whether it is that the standpipes have been broken off and bunged up and therefore not able to service you, or is it that there's no water that is coming through them? But let me just say too, that boy, the standpipe issue is one of the issues that is a major problem right now with the abuse of the standpipes by citizens, we Jamaican people. Let me just get down to some part where I talk to you. But at the same time, it is also perhaps a question where that standpipe has been disconnected at the instructions of somebody in past year or years. I don't know. But um, it's a matter that you could report to the councillor. Here again, <laughs> unfortunately, there is the, the stream you have to go through. You report to the councillor, you report to the um, member of parliament who can then speak with the National Water Commission or speak to us for us to assist in connecting with the National Water Commission. In terms of supply of water, there are many aspects to that. You know, unfortunately, and very, very unfortunately, over the years, 
perhaps enough forward planning hasn't been done in terms of the NWC building its capacity to be able to support the increase in the community levels in terms of numbers of persons. As a result, you have shortage of water. Other than that, there's a matter where the water supply at source, the wells that the NWC possess, um, are just not adequate enough in terms of their output to supply you know, the, the, the furthest points of a line to supply districts. I know the Water Commission is working on city and I know the minister in charge of that, the Honorable Harris, Dr. Harris Chang, um, are making plans and programs to look at every water supply system and as best as possible put funds in place to increase the supply of potable water to the respective districts. It's something that might take a little time. Um, as you can appreciate, the supply of water is a very costly thing. It costs millions of dollars per month because of the electricity supply to the pumping stations to supply water. But I know that there are deficiencies, but I can assure you that the NWC and the government as a whole are working to ensure that increase of water supply to the respective districts you know, is increased. But at the same time, trust me, youth, I want to appeal to you as young people in your respective communities, where there are standpipes, for instance, try to encourage all citizens to practice a more, let me just put it no stronger than a more responsible use of the water process so that there can be adequate water supply for all. I don't know if my response has been too verbose or it has um, satisfied you. But we appreciate the problems out there, but we are working as cities to see how best we can correct them. I think that's a very good way in which to end. Um, and I think essentially what both uh, Minister Green and the Mayor Sangster has essentially said to you in a lot of words is the power is in your hands. So election going to come again, you decide what you want to do. You decide who you want to elect to serve you. It shouldn't be a case where you're begging someone for their attention at all who has been elected or your tax dollar paid person, essentially. All right? Uh, but we have come to the end. It has been very, 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 very good. Goodness, have a big round of applause, please.